Hello and welcome to Train Talk. I'm Monty Miller. I'm Rebecca Cowell. And we're excited today because we're talking to Travis Kelly, who's the Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement for Texas Central. And Progressive Railroading's 2017 rising star. So uh, we're really excited to talk to Travis. He's an awesome guy. He's very tall and very handsome. So you're really going to enjoy this episode. Um, Rebecca, let's go talk to Travis. Great. All right. Hey Travis, we're just talking about stakeholders and as a as a social media guy and a web guy, I talk a lot to a lot of stakeholders online and um, on social media. So I think we're having a lot of the same conversations. How do you approach those conversations um, on a on a day to day basis? Sure. Yeah. You know, you know, it, when you just give a presentation to a big a chamber of commerce or any kind of big group, you'll get all, all the same, the usual questions, right? How much is a ticket? How many trains are going to run a day? When are you going to start construction? You know, why was my chicken so bad today? You know, whatever the question <laughs> is, right? And, and, but when you're having these one-on-one -on -one meetings, one, you get to benefit from the knowledge that that person that you're meeting with brings. And in many cases, that doesn't exist anywhere in a public domain. So um, if you're trying to understand the, a, a floodplain better so you can design, a, design the system around it, or um, you're trying to understand, um, you know, how someone else operates a railroad and things they've learned over time, it, it's very much a conversation. You know, you, you tend to learn very little when your mouth is moving, right? I think my mom taught me that. And so, um, so we, you know, we, we, we try to listen a lot too uh, and learn from these, from these folks that we're interacting with, whether they're currently operating a transit system, whether they're planning uh, on, on expanding a, a road somewhere, whether they operate a, uh, or they're you know, in charge of a, a roads in a particular county. You know, they, they, they come to that conversation with a lot of knowledge uh, that, that we want to make sure is included in the ongoing design of the project. And that they, they walk away uh, with their, their real questions answered about the, about the project and a point of contact to answer if they hear something that that doesn't quite sound right yeah that's uh that's the experiences i've had on social media too i've learned a lot from our social media followers especially on facebook where we have the most engagement um i've learned a lot about um about parts of the route that i never knew about because i'm from north texas i never spent much time in houston um so i've learned a lot about south texas and it's um it's a lot of fun to hear from uh people and to be able to talk to them and a lot of the information that um, that I know you garner in all of your meetings, that's the information I'm passing along on Facebook and Twitter when I'm answering questions. So I think there's a lot of overlap there. Um, where do you see um, where do you see that public conversation going from here? You know, there's there's a lot of public interest in the project, obviously. So you know, it's incumbent upon us to keep the public informed uh, on where we are at any given time. You know, clearly explain milestones. Clearly explain if we don't make a milestone. Um, so I think that's going to be the the big picture part of the public conversation. But I'm sure you get a lot of. I mean, very quickly the conversations get personal, right? I mean, you're looking at a high level map, but someone's call, calling you or contacting you about a specific county road. Absolutely, and that's actually that's actually the best way for um, that we can take those questions from the public and especially from landowners along the route who, um, when they have questions that um, that maybe they haven't been answered in their face-to-face -face conversations with or it's things that just come to their mind, they can ask me on Facebook or ask me on Twitter, Instagram, anytime, and um, usually we see that we see that immediately and we get back to um, the questioner. As often as possible, and it really, um, it's it really makes me feel good to know that um, that people who may think that they don't have that direct mm -hmm. line of communication with the company, that I know that I can fulfill that need of theirs, and I think that it works really well with our um, uh, our approach to uh, landowners and to um, to all of our stakeholders in general. Um, do you think that um, where do you think the conversation will go from here? I think it continues to get more and more personal, right? So in the in the um, in 2014, when the first maps came out, and at the time there were six potential alignments, and you know the the line was it was all academic, you know it was, it was a big line. It could have been on my property, it could have not been on my property. It might be in my county, it might not be in my county. But as soon as those alignments came out, it became very, very personal for thousands of people. Whether it impacted them directly, maybe their home place, maybe their neighbor. 
it became very personal and we and we don't take that for granted of course we take it very seriously here and likewise when they communicate back with you um, online or in, with me in a meeting or any of us at a presentation or anywhere else you know you know that the expectation is that that we that we reciprocate that we have an answer for that person because that that person's question their inquiry it's not academic um, it's not a general, it's very, very specific in our obligation to respond to that person and provide an answer and if, and if, and if possible work through a resolution, you know, um, that becomes real. So that, that, that right now is with us and it's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy process, purely dictated by the scale of the project, the number of parcels that are impacted and, and going through an environmental process where things shift and, and things fluctuate. Um, so that, I think that's where the conversation is. And that is may, now. That, that's a big difference between a public and a private pro project as well, is that a private, we're more building from the ground up as you're, as you're um, raising money to build the project, whereas a public where you have, you know you'll have the money in advance and then you can kind of plan more from the top down. Is that, is that how you see it? That's one. That's certainly one way to put it. You know, most people. I mean, this is a new technology to Texas. It's also a new way to develop a project like this, um, and so you know, folks are accustomed to seeing a highway, for example, be in a planning document for decades before you see asphalt. Um, so you get really used to it. By the time construction starts, you think, "Good grief! I thought that was already done." Or are they really doing it? Are they finally going to do it? Um, as a as an investor led project, you know, obviously we can't wait three decades for from conception to construction, um, and so we're moving through this this process. And, and there's been incredible public input into the project. You know, thousands and thousands of of comments received, um, and you know, we've hosted dozens of meetings. The agency, the federal agencies have have hosted dozens of meetings. Um, so there's been lots and lots of public involvement and and lots of public um, attention paid to the project. So so the public is very involved in that in that sense, uh, but it's not this prolonged, protracted, three decade long planning process um, that holds people up where they don't know if a road's gonna be there, what's gonna look like, um, and when it might be there. We're trying to get answers to folks very as quickly as we can, as quickly as the process allows us to give them some definitive answers. So when you have that many comments, you know, thousands of comments from people who are all over the state, all having different opinions and perspectives on this project, how do you then sift through all of that and come up with an alignment, come up with where your stations are? So um, we, we don't. All those comments were made to the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration. And, um, you know, they are looking at a certain set of topics uh, that, that is germane to their expertise. But I mentioned these 18, 19, some odd other state and federal agencies that are involved. And each of them have a different, you know, specialty. You know whether it's air quality or water quality or noise and vibration or whatever that particular agency's either geographic or subject matter expertise is, um, they're looking at the project's design, everything about the project, where it is, how we're going to build it, how we're going to manage construction equipment, all the rest of it through their particular lens. And likewise, they're looking at all these comments through that same lens, and they're making sure that we're addressing these comments in an appropriate way, um, and ultimately the FRA is the arbiter of these different 19 agencies' opinions. Um, and then there will be mitigation requirements of the project moving forward that, um, you know, we can't just say, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll do this. We'll use native grasses on our, on our embankments, for example. We'll, we'll do that because we don't want an invasive species coming in just because we think it looks good. We're not going to, you know, buy some fancy grass from the East Coast and bring it in and let it take up. No, we're going to use native grasses. Well, and that's just an example of one mitigation measure, right? Um, well, the FRA is going to be the entity that makes sure that we're in compliance, that we actually do use native grasses. And, that we, and that's, that, again, that's an example. And there are going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mitigation requirements of the project uh, during construction and then in kind of in perpetuity. And that will be the FRA's role in making sure that we're, that we're compliant. And so you said the public's had uh, opportunities to uh, comment. Explain um, what opportunities the public has has had to comment and uh, the kind of things that may, they may be commenting about. Sure. So in uh, November, 
or in, in 2014, uh, the 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 uh, EIS process started, and that was in June of 2014. Um, and then information started rolling out after that. There were public comment periods on the scoping uh, during the scoping period, uh, which was a very high level description of, of essentially what our proposal was, the general alignments of where we wanted to go, um, and how we proposed to operate the system. And the public was invited to provide feedback on that concept, on these alignments and so forth and there were 12 public meetings held by the FRA up and down the, the route uh, or along those proposed al uh, alignments at the time um, so to comment on even that initial phase of the project um, much work was done there have been individual meetings held by the FRA with certain certain stakeholders different counties and other you know flood control districts and others and then ultimately in December of last year of 2017, the draft environmental impact statement was released. It's 5,000 some odd pages and 11 more public hearings were held by the FRA up and down the route and the public was invited to, to, to comment. And at these meetings they could, you know, there was a sonographer there to take oral um, uh, comments, anything spoken into the record, they can hand write them, they can email them in, they can mail them in, there are probably, you know, you can, there's probably a fax number, I don't know. And, um, but the public is always welcome to, uh, to comment the, uh, to the FRA. I mean, today, yesterday, before the draft EIS, you know, the, the, you can all, there's always been an email address open, a phone line open, um, and we're actively soliciting comments as well. So as someone, again, who, who is a native Texan, who, who is working on this project every day, who has been working on this project every day for the past almost eight years, what is the biggest uh, warm fuzzy you've gotten about working on this project to date? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you, you know, when seeing it from the very beginning when it really was just a concept and you're initially running those numbers, you know, do we have a project? Oh, we do. And you kind of see it growing and growing. And I'll tell you the last one I, that really stands out was going over and visiting our contractor's office. Um, you know, we've got, I don't know, 50 people here in the Dallas office any given day, but over at the, at the contractor's office, there are you know, hundred more. I don't know. I haven't counted, but it's a it's an entire floor of a really large building, um, and they're all talking about the project. They're all talking about the high speed train project, and they're, and they're not talking about, um, you know, the things that I tend to fill my day with sometimes. You know, powerpoints and presentations and things. They're talking about, you know, ballast and cant and all this, all these technical, and they're they're, they're building the the, the high speed train project. And, and you walk by these rooms and they're having they're just offices filled with with you know professional people engineers uh, that just came off of some other big project that they built and now they're working on this big project they're building and so it's very very real and that um, in a sense is very surreal having seen it from the very very beginning when it was just me in an office by myself yeah I mean, I remember back to when it was, there were four of us in, yep. in a small office in Thanksgiving Tower, downtown Dallas. And I mean, even, even looking at where we are today in, in our new office here in the Southside and Lamar building to, to just five years ago, it's incredible how fast it's, it's, it's moved forward. It is. It, it really is. It really is. And, you know, we've had the benefit, you know, this project, given its scale, its high profile and all that it is, it really attracts a lot of people who really could be doing something else. You know, these are people who are very senior in their careers, have experience across the globe building high-speed train projects, building other big projects of note. Um, but they, they want to be a part of this project. And that's really special, right, to, be, to have been a part of something from the beginning or from near the beginning. Um, and, and it's now at the point where it's moving forward very quickly and attracting people with this incredible experience, names we recognize, companies we recognize. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty special. Yeah. Well, that is all the time we have for today on Train Talk. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.